with item number three with our executive director <coughs> and get an update real quick. Okay, good morning. Can everybody hear me? So just a reminder to those at the table, please make sure you're speaking directly into the mics. We are um, live online and, and we may have a few members coming in by Zoom. Um, so, okay, I'm just gonna jump ahead here. Super quick uh, update, just a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Um, we have uh, four new resources on the website. Um, on the tools and resources page of the website, we've got two inclusive language guides that were um, requested a while back by the Chief Justice. So um, just some terminology for uh, addressing folks in different populations. And then we also have two resources that came out of our Family and Youth Engagement Summit last fall. Um, we had uh, put together kind of some of the lessons learned for, there's one for families on advocating for themselves with um, services, and there's one for professionals on kind of providing more family-friendly services. So I wanted you all to know those four resources are on the website on the tools and resources. If you have feedback on them, please shoot me an email. Um, and then the other thing was just a quick update on the ongoing uh, work under House Enrolled Act 1359, the Juvenile Justice Reform um, Bill. We have the, the brand new Youth Justice Oversight Committee has been formed. Um, that the legislation required the commission to form that group. The Chief Justice has appointed the members. Um, it will be chaired by Justice David, which I think she sort of previewed at this meeting um, last time in April. Uh, and that group is gonna meet in this very room a week from today. So next, uh, next Wednesday, June 29th at 10 a.m., we'll have the Youth Justice Oversight Committee uh, kick off here and, and kind of um, kick off a process that's gonna last about a year and that's gonna be implementing all the different pieces of that 1359 legislation. We'll have a number of work groups. Um, and so that's, that's all getting organized now. So just want you all to be aware that that is moving. Um, and I think that's, that's my update. I don't know if anybody has any other <laughs> any questions for me. Thank you very much, Julie. As always, you are on point. So we're gonna go ahead and move to our first commission evaluation with Amanda Lopez, Transforming Consulting. Um, Amanda, are you ready? A little early. <laughs> Hi there, good morning. Again, I'm back to um, give you an update about where we're at with our status related to the evaluation for the commission. So look forward to giving you that update. <clears throat> we're gonna just share our progress of what we've accomplished so far as far as our overall project plan and timeline. We do have a draft uh, theory of change um, in front of you for review and approval. Um, and then we're gonna give you some update about where we're at with collecting our data and some uh, assistance that we would love from the commission. <clears throat> So just a reminder of what our project uh, entails as far as the evaluation. The first step in our process is to define those clear metrics and questions that we wanna answer from this evaluation project. The second step is to develop those data tools and then gather the data to answer those questions. Then we'll analyze the data and then lastly, share and hopefully use that to understand what has been the impact of the commission. So for the first step, our process was to create the theory of change, which I'll present and walk through with you here. And then the next one was to create a data management plan. So not only will this help to inform this evaluation, but it's something that Julie and the staff can use going forward to continue to collect data on the evaluation and the impact of the commission. So let me walk you through the theory of change, which I would assume most of all of us know and understand that, but just to kind of level set our understanding. So really the theory of change and it really explains the why. Why was the commission created and what is the intended impact, the intervention that we wanna have occur? So that's really where we wanted to start with the process. Um, the process that we took to develop that theory of change is we certainly looked at a lot of the guiding documents that were already developed and in place here. So certainly the state statute, which helped to form the understanding of the commission, um, the most recent strategic plan and other materials that have been created. Uh, we did meet with the evaluation work group and solicit some of their feedback um, in re reviewing the drafts. And then we also met with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which has been providing ongoing support to also get their feedback from other similar initiatives in other states. It's actually Casey Family Programs, uh, yeah. the other Casey. Casey Family Programs, which we had up there, yep. 
under that umbrella. So in front of you, which I realize uh, the audience here um, probably has a hard time reviewing uh, the theory, but <clears throat> hopefully the commission here has a draft in front of you to look at a very similar kind of model that you've seen before. So on the left side under resources, those are the resources that we're using to invest. Uh, thank you, Julie, yeah. um, <laughs> holding it up for you. Um, so we identified uh, the staff support that we have here, you know, there wasn't a full-time staff at the beginning of the commission, but there certainly is now. Um, all the different committees, the appointed members, the uh, work groups that have been formed, um, all the strategic relationships that have fostered. So the, you know, first column on the left identifies all those resources that are being invested in supporting the commission. Um, under the strategies, this is what the commission does, the tactics, and we thought it would be helpful and interesting to be able to break it out by what the staff does, those who are full-time dedicated to this, your you know, army of task forces and committees and subcommittees, and then the you, the appointed commission members who are kind of under those. So you can see listed under there, each of them have very different roles, but all working collectively together. And then the right side of the logic model is really the so what. What's the change? What's the resultant impact, a result of all the strategies, the individuals who are investing here? We wanted to break it down into short term, what we hope to anticipate seeing the change occur over the next you know, one to three years, and then that longer term, more system transformation that we're hoping to influence. Um, so you can see some of the broad categories that we've identified here, just focusing on those long term uh, impact, child health and well being, mental health, child safety, youth justice, educational outcomes, equity, family stability and wellness. In developing these, we were very intentional and thoughtful to make sure we would have methods to um, collect the data and you know, be able to track and report out on this. So that also influenced those metrics that we have in place. So I'll just pause here and ask if there are any questions about the theory of change. Okay, so I believe this is the action before you is for the commission to approve the proposed theory of change for the commission. So moved. And now that we have a quorum, yeah. I'll go ahead yeah. and um, make a motion to adopt the, the, this, um, the theory of change. Can, I, it, can someone? So moved. Okay. That was me. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So just to give you an update about what's next and where we're at in the next steps of the process. So again, now that we have that clear understanding of kind of our metrics um, and what we're doing, now we're working to gather the data. Um, a key part of our evaluation is getting stakeholder feedback to really help inform and understand how has the commission helped to inform you and the work and the actions that you've taken based on the theory of change. So we identified various key stakeholders that we wanted to reach out to, to interview, um, so do surveys, et cetera. And so these are the folks that we crossed off so far um, and soliciting their feedback. So you can see who else we'll be reaching out to, to gather that additional feedback. In addition to gathering that qualitative data, we will also gather some quantitative data, looking at those metrics that we've identified in the logic model. That will really help us um, get some baseline, get some trend data to kind of line up with where, when the commission was first formed, kind of monitor what's happened over those years. But then again, that's something that we'll be able to continue beyond this evaluation. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> In terms of gathering data from the public, speaking to the mic, sorry, can you hear me? So in terms of gathering data from the public, what's your strategy for speaking to vulnerable children or reaching out to families? Uh, I'm just curious to know how you do that. Yes, yeah, so for the gathering the public data in the statute, there specifies who you know meets up, makes up that vulnerable youth population. And so there's various indicators that we've identified. So on that side, we're not planning on doing direct qualitative outreach with the vulnerable youth. I mean, we certainly have a few members here represented to you know talk about that experience and have reached out with them. Um, but yeah, it's it's a balance and the struggle around that. We know that some of those stakeholders that we've identified are the ones that are you know, more closely connected to the vulnerable youth and families um, that we're working to support. Can you talk into the mic just a little bit better? Oh, sorry. sorry. No, but you know what? Honestly, I, I wear hearing aids mm -hmm. and I might need to move to the side because mm -hmm. it just may be the way. Mm -hmm. I can't hear the way either. 
Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Lord, <laughs> I will speak more no, no, you, clearly and me. loudly I'm then. I apologize. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sure. So any funny. any other questions about that? Start over. I mean, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know that Julie would approve that on the agenda and the timeline. <laughs> As you can see on our stakeholder list, one of our key audiences that we do want to reach out to are legislative members, which we have a few here represented. So we definitely would welcome your assistance in helping to forward that onto your colleagues to really encourage them. I know it's a downtime right now in summer session, which would be a great time, but they were really critical in helping to form the commission and continue to ongoing support. And so we would appreciate you if you could encourage your colleagues to complete the survey when we send it out and you know, make some of those personal requests so we can get as much feedback and insight from that audience. And what, what I can do on that for the, the four of you uh, on the commission is I'll let you know. I think we're gonna send it just directly to all the H accounts and S accounts, um, yeah. but then I'll let you know when we've done that. And then if each of you could kind of send a little message to your caucus and say, you know, mm -hmm. we're doing, we're evaluating the Children's Commission. If you have a few minutes answer the survey, that would be very helpful. Can the link be forwarded if we would send a personal email to each of our, of our yes. fellow legislators? Can it be forwarded? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. The the survey link will, yes. you know, yeah, absolutely. So you could we could even copy it to, you know, some of you and then you can directly forward it to your colleagues and then add that like personal note. That'd be excellent. So just an update on our timeline. Our goal at the end is to have the completion of the evaluation of the commission by the end of this calendar year. So the gray area, you can see what we've already completed and where we're at in that process. So we're very much underway of gathering all of the data, then moving towards fall, we'll start to analyze, summarize this information. We'll be checking in with that evaluation work group. They're getting, um, giving us counsel and advice um, as we're making our way. We'll help to inform those key findings and recommendations and then the conclusion. We'll, Present back. Any yes. So kind of like Representative Summers, it's hard. It's hard to understand a lot of clarity of what you're saying. But so I guess my question is: Are we going to see maybe the accomplishments of the commission over the last is it ten years or? It'll it's, it'll um, be nine years the end of this nine month. Years, yeah. So we'll have a good visual of that and see yes, how, yes, how we're doing. And, yes. Okay. Yep. So again, we're going to be answering those, you know, key research questions, which I probably should have brought up here uh, again at the front, but those really are asking, you know, what has been the impact of the commission? You know, what have you excelled at? What are maybe gaps or areas to improve and strengthen? Looking at the structure and the formation of the commission. Also thinking about how the commission has changed over time, you know, pre having a full-time employee to, you know, having a full-time executive director and did we accelerate some of the impact and accomplishments that have occurred? So yes, there'll be a good overview. We'll also have an executive summary, which will be a little more user-friendly um, to digest. And I, I think it'll be interesting because I know most of my caucus doesn't realize we even exist as mm -hmm. a commission, right? Mm -hmm. So that it'll be a good chance to maybe advertise a little bit too. Right, yeah. And those are some of those key questions in the survey that we're asking is, is really that awareness and understanding do you know who the commission is? Do you understand what their role is? You know, how have you used any of the information that's been produced and developed? And so I think that'll really help us kind of baseline our understanding and expectations and we can also inform future communications, outreach, and messaging. And I think having that information will help us kind of sell the commission. Here's what we've done or mm -hmm. what the commission's done um, since it's in action. Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. Are there okay. any other questions? No? Right. Okay. okay, so we're going to move back up to item number two and get consent on the agenda now that we have a quorum. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a um, motion to get to accept the extent of the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Okay, so now we're going to move back down to number five. Um, and that is got you 10 extra minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Thank Kate you. Shadow. 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 Sorry. Okay. Very good. Um, Indiana Department of Health presenting Youth Risk 
behavior survey data. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I just want to start really quickly and say that this is just a sample of all of the data we have. And I'm going to try and take advantage of those 10 extra minutes and share what I think is important to know for the commission today. Um, just to get us started, the Maternal and Child Health Division sits at the State Department of Health. Our state adolescent health coordinator and adolescent health team are there nestled in the Maternal and Child Health Division. There are other divisions working on adolescent health, both at the Department of Health and other state agencies. Um, but some of the work that we do is around the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant. We have four strategic priorities for the next five years around adolescent and young adult health, around um, suicide prevention, um, nutrition and physical activity, around adolescent well visits, and around positive youth development. We also hold the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Grant and the Sexual Risk Avoidance Education Grant that are run both in schools and out of schools around the state. Today, I'm gonna to be talking specifically around two of three surveys out of the CDC, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and the School Health Profile Survey. I'm just gonna shortly mention at the end a note about our upcoming Youth Advisory Board. Oh, okay. So the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a CDC survey. It's been around since 1990. It is conducted every other year in odd numbered years from January through April. We have a representative sample that's chosen by a very scientific method at the CDC of schools around the state. We use about two thirds of our base questions that are offered by the CDC and then we add additional questions that are relevant and important to us here in Indiana. The survey is a total of 99 questions. It is taken during one class period in schools. Um, in 2021, I'll share today, we added ACEs related questions. So adverse childhood experience related questions. Um, we get our sampling frame of all public high schools here across the state. It's around 300 total schools. We do a double draw in collaboration with our youth tobacco survey, which is the one I will not mention today. Um, but we select around 50 high schools here um, for the YRBS and 60 schools for the youth tobacco survey, which means schools are only offered to take one or the other if chosen. They do not take both in one school year. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey monitors six different categories, injury and violence, um, sexual behavior, adolescent drug use, or alcohol and other drug use, tobacco use, unhealthy dietary behaviors, as well as physical activity. If schools participate, they do receive a $500 incentive to participate. And then any slide that you see with a blue background is gonna be referring to school health profiles data. This is the other survey offered in even numbered years out of the CDC. It is a survey of both middle and high schools around the state and it is a specifically surveys to a school health principal and a lead health education or physical activity teacher or a nurse. And so each school that is selected out of this sample, each school takes two surveys. Um, this sample is a little bit bigger. We have 700 schools total to choose from. The CDC selects around 300 to 400 every even number year. We just completed this survey for 2022. The data that I will share today is from 2020. This specifically asks school health principals and teachers about their policies on health education, about their policies on physical activity, around what sort of classes they teach around sexual behavior. Do they have family engagement? Do they, what do they offer at lunches? And so everyone who takes this survey does receive a $25 gift card incentive. So just a note again, data with a white background is from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which surveys youth directly. Data with a um, blue background is a survey of principals and lead health education teachers. Okay. I'm sorry, could you just quickly, maybe you were gonna do this, I might be jumping the gun, but could you quickly um, cover how the survey is voluntary for youth, both the survey itself and the questions? Yes, the survey that is given to youth is completely voluntary. For most schools, they do passive consent, which means we send a notification home. If you sign that form that you're not gonna take it, they do not have to participate. All surveys are anonymous and they do not have to answer every question. So once they start, if they don't feel comfortable, nor if they do not have time to finish, they do not have to answer every question on there. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think the General Assembly has done a great job providing those safe 
safeties for kids so they don't have to identify themselves, et cetera, so that parents feel comfortable. Um, with those safeguards in place, I remember there still being not controversy, it's too strong of a word, but just families that didn't feel comfortable having their child participate. Can you tell us, you know, even with those safeguards in place of anonymity and uh, the passive consent, are you seeing good participation from the kids? That leads me perfectly into our next slide. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Sorry. So we are celebrating our 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Survey data, which is the first weighted data we've had since 2015. We did not receive weighted data in 2013, 2017, or 2019 because we did not have enough participation. I will also note in 2019, we tried this with a sample in the spring, did not. We had six participating schools. We tried again in the fall with only four agreeing to participate. And so this is a constant reminder that it is voluntary and it is very hard to get schools to do this. Um, luckily, we had that powerful persuasion of Dr. Box in this last round, who personally called the last eight schools and asked them to participate. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and so this survey, the data that I'll share today was taken in January through April of 2021. This is mid COVID pandemic. This is a time that most students were returning to in-person learning. And so some of the questions around um, what has happened on a school ground are a little bit probably not as accurate as they were not in school. Um, any statistics that are less than 30 are suppressed due to CDC guidance, so you will not see those. And then some of the trend data that you'll see on the y-axis, just note what the numbers are. We sort of zoomed in on some to make them more legible, even if the percentage is, you know, 10%. Um, and so this, again, is just a small amount of slides that I want to share with you today that I feel are relevant to the commission. If I had more time, at, there's 250 slides waiting for you if you're interested. <laughs> All right, and then quickly our sample characteristics from the 2021 YRBS. We had 1,029 students participate. We had 43 out of our 49 schools say yes and agree. Um, the CDC takes the school response rate, which was 88%, and times that by the student response rate, which was 81%, for an overall response of 71%. Um, we are not able to get weighted data if it's not over 60%, so we have not had that in those years mentioned before. These are students in grades 9 through 12. You can see sort of the breakdown of gender, grade, age, as well as race and ethnicity here. And then you can also see the sexual orientation of our students with about 76% identifying as heterosexual and then 24% as identifying as either gay or lesbian, bisexual, other, which uh, there is a note at the bottom means I describe my sexual identity in some other way and questioning I am not sure about my sexual identity and then a small percent answered not sure. So I'm gonna start with the general health and healthcare slide to just set the stage. We had less than 50% of students describe their health as excellent or very good, less than 50%. And on top of that, we asked specifically, what about your physical health? We had 52.9% of students say it was not good. And 30.7% of students say their mental health was most of the time or always not good. I also will mention that um, just 64% of students saw a doctor for a general health checkup when they were not sick or not injured so that adolescent will visit. And 71.5% of students have been to see a dentist in the last 12 months before the survey. Here at the bottom, you'll see just 17.9% of youth are getting eight or more hours of sleep per night. And there is another statistic I wanted to share, which is not on here. 78.6% of students spent three or more hours on their screen, not including schoolwork, on an average school night. So on a school night, three plus hours on a screen. Okay, I'm gonna start with mental health here. 
And again, reminder that this blue slide I'm gonna share is from the School Health Profile Survey. The good news is we've seen an increase from 2008 to 2020 for teachers who have received professional development on social, emotional, and mental health two years leading up to two years before the survey. We've also seen an increase in schools that are trying to provide knowledge on suicide prevention in a required course to their students from grades six through 12. And we've also seen more schools have a policy related to uh, increasing the social emotional climate at school and also an increase in counseling, psychological and social services. But please note, these are not 100%. This is still only 60% and 73% here in 2020. What you'll see here is this is not enough. We have 30.7%, again, a reminder who said their mental health was most of the time are not always good, just as a reminder. But when we ask students more questions, nearly 50%, one out of every two students has felt sad or hopeless almost every day for greater than or equal to two weeks in a row, so much that they stopped doing normal activities. This gives me chills every time I read it. On top of that, over a quarter of students have seriously considered attempting suicide and just less than a quarter have actually made a plan. 11.8% of students that took this actually attempted suicide. So I have some additional slides about those questions, just so you can see some more demographic breakdowns here. For students that said their mental health was not good, you can see a breakdown by male and female, by age or grade level. You can see a breakdown by race and ethnicity, and you can see a breakdown by sexual orientation. You can see a very high percent of female, multiracial, LGBTQ youth with mental health needs. I'm gonna go through these because they're the same trends. Percentage of students who felt sad or hopeless has almost doubled from 2015 to 2021. You can see the male trend line here in blue and the female in red. You're gonna see the same trend for those seriously considering attempting suicide. An increase again, but largely driven by female youth. For those that made a plan about attempting suicide, we start to see the male sort of line flatten here, but an exponential increase for female youth. And lastly, of those who actually attempted suicide, we actually see a decline in males here, but a drastic increase again for female youth. I'm gonna take those same four questions and I'm gonna break them down a little bit differently. You can see here, this impacts youth of all races and ethnicities. It is higher for females, it is higher for our LGBTQ youth. Percent of students who considered attempting suicide. Multiracial youth, exponentially higher, LGBTQ youth as well. We've already seen those female trends. When we look at those who made a plan to attempt suicide, highest here, two times the risk for multiracial youth. Can, can I ask a question? Do they have a reason for the multiracial? I mean, I can guess, but. Do they have a definition? I, 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 identifying why? No, they have not mentioned that. This is just, I'm just purely sharing statistics. There are no assumptions about why these are the trends we're seeing. Yes, thank you. And then of students who actually attempted suicide, you see the same thing here. A double the risk for LGBTQ youth, double for multiracial youth, significantly higher in females. So needless to say, the 988 number coming on July 16th is not soon enough. 
I will next transition into adverse childhood experience questions that we asked on this survey for the first time. These are well vetted by the CDC and were just offered in 2021. We will ask them again in 2023. We are lucky to have an ACES coalition here who guided us on asking these questions. We see 37.9% of youth living with someone who is depressed, mentally ill, or suicidal. That is an indicator for lifetime prevalence of household mental illness. 28.8% of youth are living with someone who has an alcohol or substance use issue, and that is a lifetime prevalence of exposure to substance use. 18.3% of youth have been separated from a parent who was in jail, prison, or a detention center, and that is lifetime prevalence of an incarcerated relative. And 13.6% have reported that they have been insulted, sworn at, or put down, and that is a lifetime prevalence of emotional abuse question. A couple of various breakdowns here you can see for youth living with someone who is mentally ill, and how it is affecting the population. Um, higher risk here for females, for LGBTQ youth, for Hispanic and multiracial youth as well. And for those who have been separated from a parent or guardian because they went to jail, prison, or a detention center, you can see this is largely impacting our minority youth around the state. The last four questions that we asked related to adverse life experiences here, you can see 8.6% of students um, don't have an adult who's making sure their basic needs were met. That includes clothing, food, shelter. That is a lifetime prevalence of physical neglect question. 8.3% of youth um, have been involved sexually with an adult, someone five years older than them. And that is kissing, touching, being made to have sexual intercourse, any of those activities during their life. That is a lifetime prevalence of sexual abuse question. 1.9% of youth have seen and witnessed their parents slap, hit, kick, punch, or beat each other up. That is lifetime exposure to intimate partner violence. And 1.3% of students who themselves were physically hurt, that is a question around lifetime prevalence of physical abuse. You can see here around that question around sexual abuse broken down by um, sexual orientation is largely impacting our LGBTQ population. Yes. Just a quick question. I, I think I know the answer, but you can't, with this data doesn't give you the ability to determine or estimate base scores for those kids, correct? Correct. Yes. So I will mention again that the ACEs screening is not a ACEs is not a screening tool, it is not to be used as a screening tool for high school youth. Um, there are tools on the commission's website that you can use that are related to ACEs outcomes. All right, and then lastly, I'm just gonna mention, we asked for the first time students if they um, felt that they were treated badly or unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. And you can see here, this largely affects our black female population. And we asked the flip side of that question. We asked students if they have witnessed their parents or other family members treated badly or unfairly because of their skin, language, accent, or because they're from a different country or culture. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about sexual behavior here. So I'm gonna start with consensual sexual behavior, which is we have 31.9% of youth that have ever engaged in sexual intercourse with a 20.8% currently sexual act, sexually active. And that's three months before they took this survey. 5.2% of youth have engaged with four or more persons in sexual behavior. And 1.4 of youth have been early initiation into sexual behavior, which is before age 13. You can see a nice decline here for Indiana from 2011 to 2021, um, from 50% down to around 31.9%.
When we look at students who have ever had sexual intercourse, you can see an increase as it goes 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And for those who have had sexual intercourse with four or more persons during their lifetime, um, largely during that 12th grade year. When it comes to early initiation of sex, you can also see a decline here from 5.2% in 2011 to 1.4% 1 in 2021. We asked students um, if they use a condom during their last sexual intercourse, and we see here um, just short of 50%. And 42.4% of students who are um, on birth control pills, an IUD implant, a shot, a patch, or a ring, we have 10.8% of our students who are using both methods, both a condom and birth control contraception. But we also have 9.5% of students who are using no method to prevent pregnancy. You can see here a decline in condom use as we move through high school and an increase in birth control pills IUD implant, shot, patch, and rings. And despite students having sexual intercourse, only 6.9% are getting tested for an STD other than HIV, and just 5.8% are testing for HIV. You can see here, largely senior females are the ones driving the uh, trend to be tested for STIs. And you can see a decline here for those getting tested for HIV. Which brings me to the end of this sexual activity that is consensual. And I will next move into sexual violence. We have over a quarter of students who reported someone they were dating tried to control them or emotionally hurt them in the 12 months before the survey. We have 14.2% of students who experience sexual dating violence. I'm gonna skip down to number to the fourth question here. 9.8% experience sexual dating violence with someone that they were in a relationship with. And if I skip back up to the third, 10% of students were physically forced to have sexual intercourse when they did not want to. On top of that, 8.6% of youth experience physical dating violence. Here is a further breakdown of those who were trying to control, were controlled emotionally while in a relationship. So largely female and double the percent here for the LGBTQ population, two times the risk. When we look at those who have experienced sexual violence they did not want to do, um, mostly females, again, that multiracial category is high in LGBTQ youth. And for those youth that experience sexual dating violence, you can see a decline here for, for males, but an increase here slightly for females. And then lastly, the percent of students who are ever physically forced to have sexual intercourse, a decline here for males, but an increase for females in the last six years. So I will note that youth are both sexually active and sexual victims, but we have 81.1% of schools that do not provide reproductive health services. Sorry, could you say that again? 81.1% of schools do not provide reproductive health services. Is that just education or? In their school-based health clinics or via their nurse, yes. And if they don't have health services, very few of them are making referrals. You can see the referral rates for getting condoms or getting contraception use has declined in the past six years. 
We're down to about 18.4% of schools that offer a referral. That means the school is not giving them out, they're referring them to re reproductive health services. You can see the same trend here from 2014 to 2020. We don't have very many schools that are offering HIV testing, treatment, pregnancy testing, or prenatal care as a referral. So not on school campus, but they are not referring to an organization that can provide that for their youth. And lastly, you saw the trends. There are only just over 38% of schools offer um, a, education and prevention and information that is inclusive of LGBTQ health when it comes to sexual activity. And my last note here is back from the YRBS. Um, this is a decline. So this means that students are not getting sexual education from their parents or their family members. So it's a decline down to 50%. Yes. So with respect to the decline of students reporting that they're getting some sex education from their parents, and, and I know there's probably no formal question on this, but do you get a sense that, do parents perhaps not say anything because they think the school is doing it? Do you have a sense of that? It's likely. There is a question that asks if they've received sex education in schools. And it's, I think, around 75% of youth receive sex education in schools. However, I will note that does not include what type of sex education. That could be just on HIV and STIs, which is under mandate here in Indiana. It does not mean comprehensive sex ed. It could mean abstinence education. Um, that's a youth's perception of if they got some education in school. Yes, sir. So I, I don't know if it's something we can talk to um, Kate about our superintendent of our schools and, um, and is our sex education or the consequences, right, of, of those mm -hmm. actions, right? So I guess I'd like to dig a little deeper into that somehow, mm -hmm. just because if we can stop kids from having kids, our, like, our life would be a lot better, and theirs as well. Well, the problem is, is that we don't want to tell them the truth. So when you don't want to tell them the truth and you don't want to give them the tools you know, yes, sex feels good. Yes, sex can produce a baby, but these are the things you can do to not do that. Indiana is not doing that. They want, they're not doing that. Now, unless you get your buddies to understand that we've got to tell kids the truth and give them the tools, that's not going to happen. So, that 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 is what's happening. That we're not telling, and and not only we're not telling them, and then parents aren't telling them either. So you know they're not getting anything all the way around. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, I definitely feel, and I also feel like it's something that um, it's an uncomfortable subject. I feel like parents need to be um, included in it. You know, it's probably something that parents feel like that boundary wise, a lot of parents feel like they want to have that conversation with their child. So as a state, just making sure, even if we not offer it in schools the way we're supposed to, we have like support for parents to come to, you know, for to empower them to have those conversations because they do start at home, you know, and probably no parent, well, I won't say no parent, but I know a lot of parents would probably be uncomfortable knowing that that conversation was introduced to their child without, you know, them being a part of it, like, just making them feel it. Um, part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think then what I hear you saying is they need to partner mm -hmm. yeah. and pick a time in the educational process where parents know and teachers know and they approach it at the same time. Mm -hmm. But Indiana is not teaching our kids of any sort of sex education. And we're not, um, no, that's not happening. And until that happens, we're gonna to continue to have, you know, all of that girl, or women, young women getting abused and thinking it's okay. So it's not only, it's not only the sexual part of it, but it's the, I'm a woman and you don't have to, you don't, I don't have to take that. Not knowing 
not knowing that, not being told you, just not, not knowing anything. You're walking around completely and totally not, not understanding. Hearing from your peers. Hearing from your, you're not your peers, your teachers or your parents. I mean, you're hearing from your peers, but you're not hearing the right thing. I'd like to echo what Representative Devon said. I, I would like a deeper conversation around this topic because the data is, is of course absolutely distressing. And I guess from where I sit, this shouldn't be that hard. Um, you couldn't Thank hear me, you. sorry. <laughs> all right, my bad. You look a lot better. <laughs> I just wanted to echo what Representative Devon said. I do think we should dig deeper into this. It doesn't feel like it should be that hard. Um, and the damage, the, the trauma that kids are suffering that could be avoided through information, education, and frankly, safeguards. You know, if, if a child makes it, a youth makes a decision that the adults in their life wouldn't want them to make, we still want them to be informed and able to protect themselves if they do make such a decision. So we could do better. And I would definitely like to talk more about this topic. And I just wanna add, even with our, the LGBTQ community, the, the, the rate is much higher on everything. Mm -hmm. So that, that means that they're not only getting hit with them being LGBTQ, they're also getting abused mm -hmm. and, and attempted, and, and their, the numbers are higher. And the numbers are higher on the multiracial. Mm -hmm. So those kids that are both, you know, for example, black and white, you know, mm -hmm. they're having a hard time identifying who they are. And they're, you know, so we got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And I know if I can. Oh, I got to take this as a grand bear. And Julian, I don't know if we can chat with the Chief Justice because I know her mental health symposium in October, mm -hmm. if that's dealing with any of that or is it staying away from that completely? I don't I mean, know. I think it's primarily the intersection of mental health and the justice system and even more adult than youth. I think there'll be some youth stuff. So it, it, may, it may not be dur as directly relevant to this. Um, as a gynecologist, I can tell you that one of the first things you have to do is define what is sexual activity, as many students will tell you they are not. And when you get more specific about various types of sexual activity and help them to understand they are sexually active and that STDs can also be spread that way. And, and I would also say that um, when we look at this data, if you can help young, you know, junior high and high school kids understand that the longer they delay becoming sexually active, the fewer sexual partners they will have and how that helps them emotionally and helps them also physically to prevent STDs. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of great things we could do as a state, but this ends up being a local decision as to what they will let you do. My kids high school, let me come in and bring slides showing them STDs, talking about HIV and condyloma and you know, preventing your fertility and your future and talking about, you know, ways to prevent this. I mean, we preach if you're on an IUD or an oral contraceptive, you always use the condom with it. You don't even tell your partner that you're using this other contraception because then they're motivated to put the condom on. So there's a lot of really great ways we could work with this, but we, we encounter significant barriers in, in doing this around the state in some areas. Yeah, the only thing I would tag on to that is uh, having the conversations in high school is probably too late. Yep. You're going to have them, they need to be a lot earlier. Yeah, they need to be junior high minimum. All right, um, we need to stay on our schedule. Thank you so very much for all of your slides and information. Um, I did see a, an email if you wanted to go into deeper, deeper dive. Um, I just want to mention that that's on the first slide. You can get that information from that email address. So. I have just two more slides if that okay. is possible. Sorry. Okay. I just want to talk really about the good things, the parent and social support. I did not pay you all to say those comments, but the good news is we have a lot of youth that feel like they are meeting their basic needs. Their parents are meeting their basic needs. We have 85.2% of youth that, um, you know, their parents know where they are, or their guardians know where they are, and 76.7% .7 who agree that um, they have consequences for their behaviors from their guardians. Um, where we need to see some improvement here is we have 
um, 83.6% of students who feel comfortable seeking help from adults that are outside of their parents. So people are seeking, students are seeking parent and other adult guide, guidance and feedback if we were able to get them these um, important skills. But what the next two show is that just around 50% of students feel close to others at their school, or they feel like they're able to talk to others, other peers about their feelings. So we've lost some of that connectedness, I think during the pandemic that is really important. And I shared that note earlier about screen time. And so with youth on social media, maybe they're less connected to their peers, um, but just 19.5% of students said they most of the time get the help they need and we need to do better there. Um, I will share quickly, um, we are starting a youth advisory board in collaboration with some of our friends at DMHA. Um, we had 229 youth apply from around the state. We selected 45 total youth, but of 229 applications, almost 100% of youth had personal experience with mental health challenges, with suicide, or exposed to that, someone that they knew, okay? So it's really important to know. Um, and lastly, this is just a call to action. Participation in this survey is optional. We cannot have this data or see trends continue unless our schools that are selected participate. Um, so if you have any influence over schools, please let them know this is very important. Um, and this is, like I said, just a snippet of the data. There are 250 slides that I will post hopefully to our website soon. Um, if you have a way that you wanna see this, if you have guidance, or if you wanna see just a special, like a one pager on mental health or a one pager on something else, please let me know. Um, my contact information is here or you can reach out to me through Dr. Box. Um, we're happy to share this with you in any way that's relevant to you and your work. Thank you. Kate, can you comment on one more thing? Sure. Yes. Um, other states took this. Usually we're one of one or two states that don't get weighted data. Thank goodness we did this time. Yes but some of them took, didn't take it till the fall. So we don't have the comparison with other states. We will have comparison, correct? Yes, and there is a dashboard through the CDC called YRBS Explorer, and you can go on there and see the United States trends as well as each state's individual trends. So once those are all in, um, you can go on there now, you can see it from the 2019 survey. But and I think that helps because we know this has been exacerbated with the pandemic, where do we, compared to other states. We are one of two states that did not have weighted data in 2019. Do you have a question for me? Yes. Um, so my only um, question is, how are we making sure that we are inclusive with the counties and the schools that we are choosing to carry on this five-year program um, based on how are we yeah. choosing our data? I know that you said schools have to be selected. What makes the school that they have to um, sorry, so you were asking how uh, schools were selected for this? How schools are selected for this and how it's inclusive. So it's a different set of 50 schools every single year. Um, we send all of the statistics around about the schools to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They um, ask for statistics as of like diversity of students, level, a number of total students, percent of students receiving free and reduced school lunch, um, an urban, rural, or suburban designation. And so of the 50 schools that we, we select, we oversample for ethnic and racial minorities. So 25 of our 50 schools categorize themselves as 20% or more as a racial um, or ethnic minority of students and then 25% of other schools. So our schools are all over the state and I've traveled to all of them <laughs> and administered the survey. So I know they're, they're a good representation from around the state. I could be wrong, but I think it was like 70% of the students were um, Caucasian for the answers. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that means it's like 30% of all the other races. So I guess I was just wondering like how our, I guess going back to my question, how do we go about choosing the schools and just making sure we inclusive. Yeah, mm -hmm. great question, yeah. And they go, um, we do over a sample. So the breakdown of Indiana data is around 90% white of Indiana population and 10% non-white. And so they, we oversample. So that 70-30 breakdown, at least um, we have weighted data in all of those categories, which means that any of these statistics you could take on a freestanding thing and say, you know, 50% 
of black students experience this, or 30% of female students are sexually active during their sophomore year. And so that's the, the method behind the madness that all of this applies to youth around the state if we get all of that participation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to, excuse me, moving on to item number six. Is Jay Shadray available online? Jay is on Zoom. Jay, can you um, unmute and say something so we can see if we can hear you? Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep, go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for arranging the remote uh, option here. Um, I will do my best here. I, if my brain was mush yesterday. It's sort of like steel cut oats today, so it's not, not great. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll do my best and uh, turn it over pretty quickly to uh, the real experts who are here to talk about um, some of the things we're doing with mental health. So this first slide here, I'm really regretting including this because it's supposed to be painful to stare at, which normally is okay, but right now is kind of hard for me. But um, I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about, um, you know, our plans and what we're doing with this influx of, of one-time federal money um, and, you know, the, the real challenge we have is that, you know, the, the mental health system um, as, as it exists right now in the state of Indiana and really most mostly around the country is is chaotic and broken and 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 just really hard to navigate for both patients and providers. And, and this, you know, I have a I have a whole thing with this slide, you know, talking about all the different um, the different uh, ways in which society and the different the fragmentation of, of treatment providers. Um, you know, makes it really hard to understand uh, exactly what to do with, with, with that one-time money. So I'll go to the next slide because um, I need to not look at that anymore. Um, so as, as you can see, um, you know, we have a whole lot of different funding sources, um, some of which are still unclear. For example, the opioid litigation um, is in its sort of final stages in terms of, in terms of being done, but it's still not quite there yet. Um, and, but all these different funding sources um, and our, our challenge is how do you, you know, balance the very real need to invest in, in, in increased access and bring more resources to the communities while also understanding that, you know, investing more resources on top of a, a, a pretty fragmented and chaotic system uh, may not be the best for, for in the long run. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the sort of priorities we've come up with. Um, uh, to, to guide our, uh, our our approach here, that first one is, you know, building out sustainable structures. Um, you know, I, I think that the the problems with our system in a lot of ways are structural and kind of fundamental. And you know, we have a great opportunity here to um, you know to to actually build out new structures uh, that that we think will um, will will be able to sustain better better access to services in the future. Um, we're also taking a look at just the quality of those systems, uh, and, and I'll take I'll, I'll talk about some of those in specifics in a bit. Um, we do we are investing a lot in access, um, you know, with 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 the idea that you know we want to take a look at the long term and not just the short term. And then finally, we've talked about it at every single meeting where where you know we where we talk about these things. Uh, workforce uh, is the single biggest limiting principle um, in terms of of, of behavioral health care, but really human services in general. Uh, no matter where we are um, in the continuum, we have workforce shortages all the way from psychiatrists down to, um, you know, kind of frontline behavioral health attendants. And that's just something we have to recognize and reckon with and, and figure out a way to, to, to make a little bit better. So you go to the next slide. Uh, you know, we've talked about 988 a ton, but that is one of our sustainable structures. Um, you know, and, and as uh, I think, uh, the previous speaker mentioned it, it is it's coming, uh, you know, it's coming both quickly and way too late. Um, so as of July 16th, uh, we have to be able to answer calls to 988 in Indiana, and we're confident that we have the ability to do so. Um, you know, and much, much more to come on 988 in the future. I will note for this commission in particular, that the first kind of outreach about 988 will go on student ID cards um, in, in the fall. So uh, you know, in terms of having that number there as advertised as a behavioral health care crisis line. So we do expect to see an influx of, of youth and adolescent calls to this, to this network um, as, as, as we go live there. Um, yeah, I won't touch on these other ones. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll share that the, the, the two presentations after this 
um, you know, I also sort of see as falling in this category. Next slide. Um, with access to services, the main thing I wanted to point out was our uh, community catalyst program. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are, um, we actually have made the, uh, the, uh, the decisions and we're, um, you know, have notified the applicants. We haven't made a public announcement yet because we're still kind of working through logistics, but I'm happy to say that a significant amount of money will go towards children and youth serving um, uh, projects through this. So look, I look forward to making some more announcements there uh, in, in the coming month. Uh, next slide. Uh, the quality system just wanted wanted to touch on, you know, we're, we're, we're taking a look at everything that, that, that we're doing, both the way our CMHC network operates, um, how our data system operates, uh, how our administrative code uh, can be an obstacle to, to progress and change. And so we're excited about that, too. Um, you know, next slide. And then finally, with workforce, um, you know, again, this is the sort of most important and also one of the hardest things to crack with, with in terms of short term um short-term initiatives um what, what i will say is uh you know we, we are moving forward with residency opportunities through uh through the uh iu school of medicine so we're excited about that because the psychiatrists in particular can kind of create entire treatment universes like in and of themselves you can fund a pretty robust treatment team with, with on a single psychiatrist license so we're excited about that um and uh, you know we're also looking for ways to both uh, re retain existing existing provi existing providers and make sure we enhance their quality. So stay tuned for some announcements on that. And I think there's a real opportunity to really focus in on uh, children and adolescent uh, evidence based and best practices um, that that we hope to announce in the in the coming uh, weeks and months. So. Um, with that, that's a really quick overview. It's probably the best I could do right now. I hope that was that, that was okay. But I'm really excited about the next two presentations because I think that they what they will do um, is they is they will illustrate specifics about how we are approaching this work. Um, uh, both of these projects um, are are uh, encompass multiple uh, sort of uh, strategies that, that that I mentioned earlier. So. Um, you know, this next one, um, before I turn it over to Tanya and Cindy, I just wanted to, to mention that, um, you know, we're super excited to partner with Child Advocates. And part of it is because, um, you know, we really need to beef up access to this very important program. But really, another thing to keep in mind is that because of this partnership, these kids and families are not only getting access to those services, they're getting access to a fierce advocate, which is what a lot of these folks need. And so, um, with that, I'll turn it over to Cindy and Tanya um, to uh, to dive into uh, what we're doing. Thank you, Jay. And you are ready to go, ladies. Mm -hmm. Hi there. So um, my name is Tanya Mary Malamba, and I'm just really excited to talk to you guys about our Child Mental Health Wraparound Program. This is Cindy Booth, the um, is, um, CEO of Child Advocates. So she's going to be talking in just a minute, but I want to kind of um, talk a little bit about our program. I think both Kate did an excellent job of kind of framing a lot of the challenges and things that we're seeing um, as it relates to children in schools and how the state uh, is um, addressing some of those or where the state continues to need um, help and support and what we can do. And I also think Jay just kind of framed kind of the response that DMHA has, um, has taken as it relates to what we're doing with some of the federal funds and things that we receive. And so this particular project falls um, as directly as it relates to access to services. Um, the Child Mental Health Wraparound Program is a, um, this is kind of, and as a glance, it's not a new program. It's been around since 2014. It is a um, home and community growth program that provides intensive services to children in their homes. And so the children who typically qualify for this program are gonna be those children with some of the highest needs. And so again, just thinking about all the things as Kate was speaking, I was thinking this is why we need these, these, these kinds of programs. But anyway, um, the program um, provides services to kids between the ages of six and 17. We use a, um, a CANS assessment, if you're familiar with the Child and Adolescent Needs Assessment uh, Tool instrument. That is the instrument that we use to, um, one of the things tools we use to determine whether or not a kid is eligible for services. Um, you can kind of see, um, this is a Medicaid-based program, so children do need to be Medicaid recipients to participate in our program. Um, we have a couple of different service lines, I'm not gonna get deep into the service lines, but just to give you a high level overview of what those services are. 
Um, we have a wraparound facilitation. Our program is based off a national model. We work with the partner with the University of Maryland for our fidelity measures and, and other um, components of our program. So we can be sure that the kids are getting the quality services they need. We also have a skills-based service called habilitation. Again, providing those kids with the skills they need to kind of address some of the issues and the concerns that they may be um, feeling and, and dealing with um, in their just life experience. We also have a service called respite which provides that caregiver a break um, from just their caregiver duties and step away. And, and, um, and so, and also allows the kid just to have some fun. You know, sometimes we overprogram our children. They're in lots of therapy, counseling, sports, all kinds of things. So this is just kind of a fun um, break for the caregiver and an opportunity for the kids to just engage in just fun activities. And then lastly, we have a service called Family Support for the Uncanny Caregiver, which is really a service that provides that caregiver with some support as it relates to just managing the kids' behaviors in the home. Could be These are just examples, managing the kids' behaviors in the home or managing their home in a way, whatever kind of support that caregiver might need that's gonna help them maintain that youth in their home. So that is what that service kind of entails. So this is just quick high level overview of our program at a glance. Um, I want to provide you with some statistics about our program and kind of where we are and kind of, you know, what we're seeing. Um, so again, as I said, our program is not new. It, um, these are our enrollment numbers from 2014. As you can see, we've had steady kind of enrollment over the past roughly nine, eight years or so. Um, we did have that dip in 2020. I think that's just because, you know, a lot of our referrals, um, come from schools. A lot of our referrals come from, you know, community mental health centers. And obviously the world was a different place in 2020, as we all know. And so there was a, a decrease there, but we were right back at it. And our numbers are definitely headed in the right direction. But in addition to why it's important to note that we have had steady enrollment since um, the implementation of our program, there are also things that we know also exist from other data and things that we look at. So when we look at the data across um, this higher state, we have more than 30 counties with either no youth enrolled in our program or less than five youth enrolled in our program. Um, historically, Lake County has some of the lowest enrollment numbers across the state. And when you think about Lake County, if you're familiar with Lake County in the northwest corner of our state, this is highly populated, very distantly populated um, area of the state. And so um, in comparison to a lake versus like a Marion County, which has like similar kinds of demographics, um, Lake County definitely has some of the lowest enrollment numbers in the state. Um, from a health equity lens, Lake County also is home to many of um, some of the state's highest population of African American and Hispanic communities. So these kinds of things are very concerning to us when we look at the spectrum of who we are serving in our program or who has access to the services um, our program offers. Um, we use administrative data out of Dharma. Um, and so when we take a look at that administrative data, um, estimations are that, and that our program is only serving about 28% of youth who are potentially eligible. And so again, kind of going back to that CAN score, we look at, we, Dharma collects um, the score for the um, CANS assessment. And so we take a look at those CAN scores and particular youth, potential, potential youth who will be eligible. And from that, uh, we can estimate this 28% number. And again, these youth, um, are you who are Medicaid eligible? So, um, in talking about access to services, um, up until this past year, the model that um, this program used was more of a community-based model, was more of a local access model where families would go to local um, agencies within their counties and that, that local agency or entity would help them uh, complete all the paperwork and necessary to gather the information and send the information to the state so that the state DMHA would determine eligibility. And we really began to think about this model um, and what was working and what was not working. So for many years it was kind of working, but as we, the program grew, we started to have some barriers, which is what we see here. And I'm just going to quickly talk about some of those barriers. So first of all, um, we call those uh, points in the community access sites. Um, and so when the family would go to the access site, 
in our mind, it, you know, it was supposed to be like a single point of entry for um, gateway into services, but really what we created was multiple entities across the state, which led to multiple contact telephone numbers, which led to multiple different people that they were called. There was no real consistency. And with um, agencies turnover and, you know, just moving around, people move around within the organization, it became a lot more complex. It wasn't a single point of access at all. Another thing that the access sites were responsible for was outreach and education. So DMHA required that if you were going to be an access site to kind of do the outreach and education within your community, let the folks in your communities know that this is a program that is available to them and they can sign up. Um, but again, because we, um, the state with DMHA was relying on um, the entity to kind of do this um, outreach and education for us, the entity itself had their own, um, you know, uh, uh, they had their own um, concerns and things that they had to deal with in terms of just their own management of their own business. So sometimes outreach and education wasn't done consistently. Sometimes it wasn't done at all. It was just very inconsistent across the state. And so we weren't sure if folks in the community were learning about our program in ways that we will, that the state, the DMHA would like to promote it. Another concern that came up was um, just overall, in general, it was difficult for the state to manage the data. It was difficult to get the data from the entities. At this point, we had like over 26 entities in addition to the um, different ind individual organization, it was over you know, 40 plus individuals who were actually in different counties. So lots of different people, lots of information coming from different places. Um, and while you can try to create the best spreadsheet or the best possible way to gather that information in a um, consistent manner is very challenging to, uh, to get that data in a way that um, makes sense um, and you can do something with um, to um, as it relates to access. And also the family experience was different. You know, if you um, depended on the, um, the knowledge of the person who was at that access site or um, the family could go and receive a very positive experience or the family could go to a different point, access site in a different county and receive a different experience. And so those are just some of the things that we kind of wanted to tidy up as we kind of re-envision what access to our program will look like. And lastly, the one thing I also want to mention was inherently there was a conflict of interest in this because the entities that we were working with to provide access to our program were also service providers. And um, our program is a 1950i a program, so based on that, there was just things that you know it, we felt it was best that the service providers not also be responsible for um, helping families apply, because it just kind of creates an inherent um, um, inherent conflict of interest. So these were just some of the various episodes we went through, um, and we started to recognize that we don't want to think about how. Um, families access our program in a different way. And we start to think more about a statewide access site and bringing more, more of the information, um, uh, allowing DMHA to have more control over the information that was going out and the data collection that process that was coming in. So we began to think about that. One thing we knew for sure that we wanted was we wanted to get rid of all these multiple different telephone numbers that we had. And so we partnered with 211 um, it was a pre-existing number that already existed. It allowed families to, you know, many people already knew about 211, but it also allowed them to be able to um, get in, um, have other referrals for other resources they may need if they were to call that number. So you can call that number and you can ask for a wraparound referral, but also if you had other concerns or need other community-based resources, those uh, navigators at the 211 center could also refer the family. So we really thought that was a really good partnership. Uh, other things that we had to do to support a statewide access site internally, the MHA had to do just a lot of enhancements to our own database because again, we're talking a lot about data because prior to, we just really had lots of challenges in the way we were collecting data. And we really wanted to beef that up and be able to really um, just, just have the data and um, be able to use that data to inform our practice moving forward. So we've just made a lot of um, enhancements to our internal databases. And lastly, we created a web-based referral portal. So in addition to 
families or any more community members being able to call 211 to say, hey, I would like a referral for wraparound. There's also a web-based referral for that anybody can go to. So um, on a phone, on anything, it's very simple. It's just some basic information that you would need to input there. And that um, referral portal, once they click submit, it immediately goes to the uh, statewide access site and they can pick it up from there. And so again, as we start to think about um, this, what we wanted, we start to also think about partnerships and who we thought can do this. And kind of as Jay said, we really was also looking for someone who could be a true advocate for kids um, and kind of in, enters child advocacy. So I'll just let Cindy just go on and talk about her organization and kind of the work that they're doing. And we'll go from there. <laughs> Thank you so much for including me today. I really appreciate it. And this is, uh, as you heard the need earlier um, and the changes that DMHA wants to do this, this site, uh, when, when Tanya called me and Jay called me, we, we thought it would be a perfect uh, partnership for us as advocates, but also as professionals who see you know, what goes wrong when you don't have the services that children and family need. So Child Advocates has been working in the child welfare and delinquency system for 40 years and we have a strong legal team with lots of um, experience and uh, people who've been around for a long time. We also have a strong knowledge and foundation about diversity and race equity that has been very important to us throughout our time. And so we, um, we decided that we'd like to take a look at this partnership. And so as advocates, we, could believe, we believe that we could not only um, fulfill the performance of the grant as, as DMHA wanted us to, that is the process of getting families better access, but we could also observe and give indications of when we could be advocates for improvements in the system as well. So we believe that we could approach the statewide access site uh, with our child ad, uh, advocacy experience, our organizational strength, and also our look to data, particularly data related to disproportionality, which was very important to our development as an agency in the child welfare system. And important to the commission's purposes and DMHA's purposes, I think, moving to the statewide access site to access uh, wraparound facilitation as a method to assist in our mental health challenges was really important to us as well. So our directives from DMHA were pretty clear. You heard that around, I think it was 28% of the children who were presumed to be eligible or who could access this site, it was only about 28% were actually accessing the services or those facilitation. Um, also, we were told we needed to increase access consistently across the state, particularly to BIPOC and LGBTQ communities. And so that's been a real focus of ours. We are working on an, a media plan and an outreach plan that we hope to unveil soon. We are in the first third of the rollout wave that I think Tanya's gonna talk about. So we're only in 30% of the state, the counties right now. The next wave will come a little bit later this year to be in all counties uh, by the end of the year. A very important thing that we've talked about a lot and I was so pleased to hear uh, DMHA uh, revamping and improving their own data system is our reliance at child advocates on data. So not only just sort of thinking you know the demographics of the people you serve, but actually knowing that. And so our reliance on data, I think, was something that they uh, have directed us. It is something they've directed us to, to monitor. And again, then consistency in the process so that people in Park County will have the same kind of experience that people in Marion County will have and so that we can um, overcome some of the challenges that they experienced. Not that people didn't want to do good things in, in the local access sites, but just standardizing, standardizing that process. So we understand our purpose is to shepherd people to the eligibility piece of um, applying for this service. And then for those families who don't meet the eligibility, our team of family liaisons will try to find services that will help them in their own areas. And so, one of the things I said to Tanya was, we're advocates at Child Advocates. So if we see, number one, we don't have enough mental health services and we don't have enough mental health services that reflect the communities, what will we do? And I have to say that my experience has been, they've been very responsive so far in our first two months of doing this about our information when we um, let them know, you know, we can't have, we can't open the pipeline and then have children on a waiting list. We just cannot do that in the state of Indiana. So, 
kind of as Cindy um, kind of alluded to, this is very new. We've just recently rolled out. We're not, um, the plan is for them to be statewide by the end of the year right now. They're in the first 30 counties and we're moving toward um, phase two very soon. Um, so that's just kind of where we are. Let's see what, so next steps. So next steps, complete the rollout, which is kind of what I just said. We talked about, um, we have um, all right, definitely plans in the works to do a full blown kind of uh, outreach education and marketing campaign. We've already done a couple of things across the state already. And so we're definitely um, want to just have a consistent message statewide. Um, it's really important um, to DMHA, it's also important to y'all. It's just really, we feel like this is very necessary. And then also just continuing to track enrollment numbers. We're also looking at things like how long is it taking families to get through and what is slowing things down? So those are just um, key factors that we have built into our database and the systems to track. You know, if families get stopped here, what, what is the challenge? What can we do to move things along faster through that um, enrollment process? And again, lastly, um, because this project is funded through some of the federal funding that we received here, and we also have our eye on sustainability. This is not something that we uh, just want to end when the funding ends. So we've already begun, DMHA has already begun talking with our other state partners and stakeholders to think about what sustainability looks like once the grant funding ends. And that will be, any questions? Uh -huh. Okay, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around this. So um, the children that don't qualify for CMHW, currently they can access services through CMHI. So will child advocates now take the place of that and refer to CMHI or refer them to services so that they don't necessarily need to access CMHI? Nope. So what happens is, so all children who are eligible, all children who are interested in wraparound, regardless of funding stores, comes through the access site. So if, if child advocates receives a referral for a child who does not have Medicaid, but they meet all the other requirements, which means they could potentially be eligible for CMHI, child advocates makes the referral to CMHI. So child advocates makes their refer to your folks and they pick it up from there. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Thank you very much, ladies. Very right, thank you. Okay, and Dr. Zachary Adams or Dr. Rachel Yoder? Dr. Rachel Yoder. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm Rachel Yoder. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and assistant professor at IU School of Medicine. I'm proud to co-direct and serve as a consultant at, for the Indiana Behavioral Health Access Program for Youth, which we like to optimistically call Be Happy. My goal here today is just to give you an overview of our program, our role in mental health access for kids in Indiana, and our progress thus far. I know that all members of this commission, and we've talked about this multiple times today, are acutely aware of Indiana's mental health services needs. We're among the lowest in state rankings of child psychiatrists per capita and are sim have similar workforce challenges at all levels of mental health providers. At the same time, we know that catching and treating mental illness early can prevent worsening outcomes and their multi-layered long-term negative outcomes. Rising to meet this challenge we know requires a multifaceted approach and be happy since its start in 2019 has been a key piece to the puzzle of increasing Hoosier kids access to timely and evidence based mental health care. What is be happy it is a phone consultation line in which any provider throughout the state of Indiana taking care of kids with mental health concerns can call and speak with a child psychiatrist. These providers include general pediatricians, nurse practitioners, family medicine physicians, social workers, and others. These Hoosier providers, they are excellent and they work hard for their patients. We've been asking a lot of them in the setting of mental health workforce challenges. We also know though that only, for example, in pediatricians, one in three report sufficient training to diagnose and treat children with mental health disorders. They want to do more for their patients, but they want to make sure they're doing it safely and appropriately. Before they had the ability to call be happy, they had a start choice for their patients. They could either attempt to start the treatment plan they were a little unsure of, or they could refer to a mental health provider knowing that they would be on a long wait list and likely getting worse outcomes while they're waiting. With be happy, we, these providers, get immediate treatment guidance with, from talking to a child psychiatrist. 
We also provide local resources and support a holistic treatment approach. When mental health concerns are addressed in a timely manner, many patients improve, allowing their whole course of care to stay with their pediatrician or primary care provider. At the same time, there are certainly patients who absolutely need to be seen by a specialist. And for these patients, Be Happy allows for safe bridging while they are on the wait list until they're able to see a specialist. This work, in effect, immediately expands the state's mental health workforce because it enhances the mental health care capability of providers to whom patients have the easiest access and with whom they generally have the most comfort. In comparison, we've seen to other states, our Hoosier providers are exceptional in their uptake and use of the Be Happy program. As of last week, we had 658 enrolled providers with over 1,400 consultation calls. We've been able to expand our reach throughout the state and are continuously working to target areas in need with a particular focus on rural and systemically minoritized and underserved populations. Our call volumes, like my clinical practice, follow a seasonal pattern and we've reached our highest volume ever with over 70 calls this past March. The Be Happy program gets phenomenal reviews from providers. We frequently see words like life-saving and lifeline, and I'm most excited that it's clear that outcomes of these consultation calls extend beyond the individual call as providers report using what they've learned with other similar patients. The Be Happy program has been implemented since its inception with support from a time-limited grant and contract funds. We are thrilled to have a little bit more breathing room currently, thanks to receipt this past September of the Health Resources and Services Administration Grant through the American Rescue Plan Act. The HRSA grant was awarded to the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration Division of Mental Health and Addiction in partnership with the IU School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. This grant allows us to continue operations, expand our outreach efforts, and initiate a free statewide monthly child and adolescent mental health educational echo series. Here's an example of our topics this year. They are informed by the calls we receive and are provided by experts in the field. They've been well attended by providers throughout the state and beyond actually and are reaching a variety of provider types and continue to grow in attendance each month. Since receipt of the HRSA grant, we've been able to conduct more targeted surveys with providers. I'll orient you here if you can look at the page with lots of colors and lines. Um, the green is good. That means they strongly agree or agree. The yellow and orange means disagree and the gray means not applicable. We're happy to see that a significant majority of providers indicate they're more confident in addressing similar pediatric mental health issues. They've gained knowledge, they're better able to provide medications, they're more comfortable addressing mental health issues, and they state their patients receive mental health assistance more quickly through the program. We do see in that third line, a smaller majority indicate that they're able to guide their patient in obtaining therapy. We believe this reflects the overall difficulty with access to therapy throughout the state. And we're excited to share that thanks to philanthropic support through the URSA and Simon Pacers Foundation, we're actively in the process of recruiting four psychologists to provide direct telehealth therapy for patients throughout the state who are just struggling to find therapy locally. Our future goals include expansion to provide services to adults and perinatal patients. We have to take care of the parents too. And the need is clear and similar programs in other states report high use of their adult and perinatal consult lines. We are similarly mindful of both the critical importance of this work and the time limited nature of the grant. So we're actively working towards a sustainability plan. And we very much appreciate the guidance we've received from members of the DMHA, Children's Commission and others in this endeavor. So thank you very much for your attention and support. Thank you, any questions? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Yoder, I want to say I love this program. This is teaching Amanda Fish, right? So yeah. that we're training our providers across the state to be able to be comfortable to treat at least the basic mental health issues and screen for them in children. And now even talking about expanding that to perinatal, you know, substance use disorder dis support and, and mental health. And as I go around the state and talk to providers, the ones that know about this, are overwhelmed with this. They absolutely love this. So 
the more that we can do to support this and get this around the state to all of our rural communities, I think this would be amazing. I totally agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have our educational outcomes with Joan Smith. Welcome, ladies. Good morning. My name is Maggie Stevens, and I serve as the president and CEO of Foster Success. We are a statewide nonprofit organization working to support our state's older foster youth as they're transitioning out of care. And I am here with my colleagues from DCS and the Department of Education to talk to you today about some work that we've been doing, looking at um, looking at the foster care education outcomes for students in our state, but more importantly, sharing with you some of our work that we have planned, um, that we have been doing, and we have planned for the near future to change the story of these outcomes. So just a qu some quick context, I'll let each of my colleagues um, introduce themselves when they get up here in a second. But uh, what I wanna do quickly is give some context as to what got us here today, what the foster care education outcomes report is um, and, and where we're going with it. And so um, this is the statute that was passed back in 2018, um, House Enrolled Act 1314, that Representative Devon authored and Representative Summers co-authored. Um, and we are here and doing work with it. So thank you. Um, this legislation basically requires the state, the Department of Education and DCS to work together to track the education outcomes, performance um, and non-performance of our K-12 students who are in foster care in a given year. So for the past four years, the State Board of Education has issued a report that has shared the data and the demographics. Um, through transitions uh, at the Department of Education, through everything else that we know our schools have been dealing with over the past two years, I'm really excited that over the past 12 months, we've been able to regroup with um, a new vision and really focus on what these numbers are. Because it probably doesn't surprise you that the numbers haven't changed over the past four years. They haven't gotten worse, but they definitely haven't gotten better. Um, we see very low numbers of our students who are in foster care finishing high school, those who are finishing, a third of them are finishing with waivers, which means they're not meeting the standards and expectations that we as a state have put forth for them. Um, they're experiencing higher levels of suspension and expulsion, and my colleagues will dig into that in a second. Um, and that's been consistent since we started looking at this data a few years ago. We presented a similar um, presentation just two weeks ago to the State Board of Education talking to them about some of the work that we are doing. And we are um, honored to be here today to share some of this information with you um, and, and would love your input and thoughts on where we take it. Um, and as we start digging more deeply into the data, tracking some new data elements, um, we hope to continue to change the story. So let me turn it over to my colleagues to share some of the key findings from this past year um, and then some exciting work that we're doing. Hi, good morning. My name is Melaina Gant. I am the Director of Education Services with DCS, and I'm also the state point of contact as it pertains to the Every Student Succeeds Act for the agency. Um, so I'm here today to uh, tell you about the key findings that we found with um, the report in this last year. Uh, as you heard from Maggie, they're not great, but we have a plan and we can do better. So 90% um, of students in foster care were enrolled in traditional schools and public schools, um, and only 5% or just over 5% were enrolled in public charter schools. Um, our youth were less likely to graduate on time when compared to their general population students, and those that did, like Maggie said, were more likely to uh, graduate with a waiver in place. Um, one challenge that we find with our graduates, graduates that they are learning earning less rigorous diplomas, which sets them up for uh, less, to be less prepared for life after high school. Twice as many of our youth receive general diplomas um, compared to all students. And when looking at the honors diplomas, our general population students earned, um, earned those at a rate more than three times that of our youth, our population. Um, that's, that's challenging. And then when we look at our retention rates, our youth are at an alarming rate of three times more likely to be retained 
than general population students. Another significant challenge is exclusionary discipline. Uh, we had a bill go through quite a while ago, 1421, House and World 1421, that uh, was about uh, more restorative practice in our discipline. And we really need to see that revitalized and really reviewed uh, because our youth in care are twice as likely to be suspended and four times as likely to be expelled. That's huge. Four times more likely to be expelled. We know that exclusionary discipline does nothing for the education journey of our students. Um, however, while this information that I've just presented is a little disheartening, right? Um, we use this data and we took the, a more positive and collaborative step to better support the educational outcomes of our students. As you see here, we're much more collaborative than you've ever seen in the past. Um, and in 2022, DOE and DCS have been much more proactive in providing training opportunities for local schools and our DCS offices regarding ESSA and how true implementation of the requirements specific to the youth in foster care will positively impact these outcomes for our youth. DOE and DCS also have a bi-directional data exchange in place through MPH um, that's going to allow real-time educational data to be shared on all students in foster care, and it's projected to be fully implemented by mid-year 2023. Um, that's just dependent on the two data systems. There's a lot of software lingo that Joan and I are participating in that uh, we get to hear about, and then we just kind of glaze over and we say, okay, now when? And then that's when we move forward. So now we are at mid 2023. So it's really exciting because DCS has also increased the number of educational services consultants throughout the state to 15 now. Uh, we were practicing at 11. So we have four additional positions that we have added to serve our students across the state. So that real time data is really going to help us um, be more proactive in assisting rather than putting out fires. We can be proactive in looking ahead. Um, and then also um, DOE created an amazing action plan to better support the schools in, in their education of our youth. And jo Joan is gonna detail that out for you. Madam Chair, can I ask a quick question? Any questions for me? <laughs> I didn't want you to get away, that's <laughs> um, In the data that's being collected, is there a collecting of the data that, of how many of these foster students are involved in um, the the juvenile delinquency system? Not at this time. However, we are hoping once we have the real-time data exchange, we will be able to cross-analyze and be able to really pull out some, some meaningful data uh, related to mental health diagnoses, uh, participation in programs, uh, their engagement with probation or possibly juvenile justice system. JDAI, those type of things, we will be able to cross-analyze and, and prepare reports together. Great question. Any more? Any? Okay, go ahead. Um, do you have any data about the number of schools um, these foster youth and kids go to, the number of times they switch while in care? Again, that is going to be, once we have the real-time data, we'll be able to pull that information and create that, that sub that cross analyzation of the data. So right now, we, DCS has that data, but we can't fully compare it until we have a full 100% match with D DOE. Um, and so once that happens, Joan and I are super excited. We cannot wait for this to happen. Um, it's been in the making, I'll be honest, for 10 years I have been pushing to get this um, integration and the technology is finally here. So um, this is just really exciting. And um, again, once we have those that data, uh, we can foresee the impact on the educational outcomes for our foster population to be significantly impacted. Any other questions? All right, I'll Thank jump. you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Joan, and I am the foster youth specialist over at the Department of Education. Um, so like all my colleagues shared, um, we kind of came together to figure out what were realistic goals and also what were actionable goals moving 
forward once we actually had the data. So I came on in June and one of the first things that I did was survey the points of contacts um, at, that each LEA has. Because I, I came in really, I was a school social worker and I was just like, I don't know what they know, what they don't know, and really what all of their role entails. And so using that feedback from that survey, I had over 300 um, POCs participate. One of the things that we noticed was one of uh, that was missing was they really didn't fully understand what their role was. There's so much transition and that's a role that is attached to their already standing position at the district. So it may be a transportation director, it may be a superintendent, it may be a school counselor. And so how do we get them all to have the same information? And so using that data from the survey and then also the data that we uh, collected and shared between DCS and DOE, these were the four action plan goals that we came up with. So the first one is to encourage districts to enact positive discipline practices and deliver resources to districts that will reduce the suspension and expulsion of students in foster care. Number two was broaden and intensify services and supports offered to students in foster care in order to increase graduation rates. The third was to create and share a variety of targeted professional development resources specific to the role of the foster care point of contact, clarifying the expectations and responsibil responsibilities of the POC and the specific needs of foster youth. And the last, uh, probably the most exciting and also the most daunting, was to create a blueprint of communication and processes to help and support increased collaboration among foster youth, foster families, DCS education services, LEAs, and community-based service providers. With the eventual goal that successful models of collaboration will then have the opportunity to be replicated across the state. So these are very broad and very lengthy goals and they have all been broken out. I'm not sure if you have a copy, um, but I'm happy to send it to you after this today. Um, and they've been broken out and, and follow very closely the homeless remediation plan with what can we do, what steps can we take, when are we reevaluating these goals um, and, and moving forward on them. Joan, can you just define LEA, please? Oh yes, local education agency, so each school district. I didn't know what that meant before I even came here, so. <laughs> So what have we done thus far since we uh, established these goals? So the first thing that we did was create a standard operating procedures for the role of the POC. Um, so that was just created to explain, since there's so much transition within that role, exactly what that role entails, what are their responsibilities? Um, and then that was posted just on the general page, but then we actually had two winter uh, webinars for those points of contacts where we really tried to engage them and explain what that SOP uh, was all about so that they could ask questions. And everybody uh, that is here today was with me present make, doing those webinars. We also did a transportation training because we have realized that one of the major barriers for our students in care is transportation and getting to school, especially once they've changed districts. So, um, and, that, and that's just honestly, transportation has been a really big challenge due to COVID in general for majority of our students. Um, and so we, we tried to come up with some creative solutions uh, for how to transport our students and get them to school on time. Um, and we just provided that to our director, directors of transportation as like a friendly reminders and also here's some cool creative solutions uh, so that we can get our kids to school. Foster Success sent out an e-blast um, with education resources that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit to our foster care points of contact. And then I'm really excited for Allie to speak with you on this amazing resource that she created called the Foster Care Flashcard. Hello, my name is Allie Leonard and I will be a senior this fall at IU Bloomington. Um, I'm also a Jim Casey Young Fellow from the 2021 cohort and that has allowed me to be a part of many different projects this past year um, surrounding the foster care experience in Indiana. More recently, issues in education um, that I have personal passion on improving. And I partnered with these ladies and my peers to develop a youth engagement resource for administrators and teachers, and hopefully anybody who really has contact with foster youth in K through 12. Um, this is a culmination of my peers and my own experience in transferring schools and or homes. Um, and what was found was that foster youth struggle to gain social capital 
and intentional and consistent contact with adults had a lasting influence on their choices in the classroom. This could mean anything from motivating them to even mitigating behavior issues. Um, I had positive and negative experiences, and if it weren't for the counselors at my first high school, I probably would have never known how to apply to college on my own. Um, and the two points that I really wanted to highlight on this card is to ask and not assume, because taking the time to meet the young person where they, at, where they are at represents that their progress matters um, and the youth are more likely to engage. The second point I wanted to highlight is to be involved in their response plans. And this is to make sure that it's appropriate, especially given how much of their day they spend at school and in your classrooms. And I will pass it back to Maggie to finish up the details. So I'll please feel free to look over that and engage with Allie after I wrap this up here in a second. But as you can see, um, this really has been a joint effort to try to increase our resources for our educators very broadly. Um, so as it says up there, we are working to more broadly share that foster care flashcard, um, clean it up a little bit. We've sent it out as a PDF. Um, but we want to get these tips and ideas in the hands of educators across the state. Um, so we're actively working on that at Foster Success. Um, and related to that, I'm going to go out of order on what's on the slide. We are working in collaboration again across all these organizations to put together a one-day conference in September for educators across the state. So we anticipate about 500 individuals coming together um, to learn from and with our youth who experience foster care. Um, Allie's jumping on board with that. We're going to bring some other young people on board to help us think through this. Um, what I really appreciate about what Allie has brought to this presentation, to all of our work, and what she continuously reminds us to think about as we plan for this conference is we're not going to spend the day telling only the bad stuff, right? Telling about where systems have failed young people. Unfortunately, we know those stories. We know they're out there, but we really want to focus on who and what have made a difference for our young people as they have moved through our systems, specifically in the education system. So she's already connected us to a young woman um, who's gonna present who is now teaching because of teachers who helped her through her work. And so we're really excited um, to get the word out, bring people together and have these conversations and share these resources more broadly. Um, additionally, again, as Joan and Melena said, we are creating more and more professional development opportunities for our educators. We did the transportation training. We're gonna be working um, on a, a training for judges to look at ESSA laws, what needs to be considered when these cases are in the courtroom and we're looking at where our kids are going to school and how they're performing. And so um, we're just really excited as somebody who's been involved with this work since 2018 when the legislation was passed, um, seeing the, the progress we've made in the past 12 months is very rewarding and very exciting. Um, and again, I'm hopeful that in a few years, when we look at these numbers again, we really will see um, the numbers that we want to go up will go up and the numbers we want to go down will go down. And so thanks for, for thinking through this with us. Um, I'll open it up to questions. You probably want to talk to them more than me. Um, but thank you again for your time today. Yeah, not, not a question, just a comment. This is beautiful. And I think it's a good reminder for everyone. So great job, Allie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always proud of what you. you do, but this is fantastic. <laughs> good to see you again. Yeah. But we're going to give these back so that you can give them to the teachers. To the teachers. There's, there's one, please. If you oh. would like to utilize it or share it with colleagues, please feel free to keep it. If you don't, we'll take them back. But please, we do have one. Keep it. Okay, so just another comment. You keep them because if we have any of our young people testify before committees or something, I think this is important for our legislators yeah. to have. Yeah. So I think it's good to keep. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a comment. And, and I'm just excited to see what you guys are doing. Uh, it wasn't just to get data. I, I mean, that was the point behind it, but to see where you're taking and you see the needs and fill in the gaps. Uh, we got to continue to do better. I remember. And this young lady over here, Dejana, was, was speaking to legislators and, and kind of tugged at our heart. And um, this is just one step, Dejana, that we listened to what your cry was. And uh, we've got to continue to do better. And I'm, I'm excited to see what we're going to do better at. Thank you. Okay, future meeting topics. Anybody have Anyone have any ideas? Not? 
No? Okay. Real, sorry, real quick. Uh, this week I got Terry meet with Terry Decker and we got to visit um, two of our juvenile correctional facilities in the state of Indiana, one in Logansport, one in um, LaPorte. And uh, they're doing some really good stuff education wise there, I believe. At least I was encouraged to see how the state handles the kids versus at the county level. So, um, you know, it's, it's sad that we have kids there, but for these kids that find themselves, it's a safety net, right? That we can keep these kids out of trouble, help them improve themselves and, and do things better. So, and lastly, uh, next week I'm heading to Seattle to a homeless youth conference through NCSL. So I'm not sure what I'm finding there, but um, be prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come back with ideas. Okay, our next meeting is August 24th. Mm -hmm. And if there's mm -hmm. no other comments, motion to adjourn. Thank you all. Good. <laughs> 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 <laughs>